Right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's my grand entrance um, welcoming you to uh, try this Tuesday. This is uh, my dog, Winston, who in proper form is barking, and that is a part of our new lifestyle right now of um, trying to juggle work and being home and uh, children and pets and things like that. So I'll hold him for the time being. Um, but want to welcome everyone to today's Try This Tuesday session. Uh, this is a part of the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce Daily Action Calls. And I'm Cecilia with Action Greensboro and really excited to host today's Cinco de Mayo at Home celebration. The theme of the Try This Tuesday calls are really around how do we have fun, how do we find new approaches to business, relationships and living uh, when, when we're all at home, um, juggling things like work and dogs and um, children and things like that. So we're excited to mix up today's call. It happens to be Taco Tuesday. It happens to be Cinco de Mayo. And it's, of course, an opportunity to learn some history and have some uh, celebrations at home when we're all looking for fun things to do. So I want to remind you a couple things. Um, all of our calls are online, and they're all referenced on the Greensboro Chamber's website at greensboro.org backslash COVID-19. And you can see all the previous calls since we started these in early March. So all of them are archived. You can also find us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at GSO Chamber for the latest information. And you can also follow Action Greensboro at Action GSO and Action Greensboro on Facebook and, and, and Twitter. Um, two quick commercials for you. I uh, want to remind you that the Greensboro, or excuse me, the U.S. Census needs your uh, input. So if you haven't taken the census yet, it's super important to do that. It um, helps us with federal dollars uh, to our communities and our state across the state. Um, it also helps with congressional seats. And so North Carolina right now is 38th in the nation for census completion. So it's really important to have you complete the census. So if you haven't done it, today's the day. It's also a great activity to do with your children. Also want to remind you that DGI has a fundraiser going on and I see it as a Triple bottom line. The first is you get a tax deduction when you make a donation. The second is they support downtown restaurants with those dollars. And then the meals that are purchased from those restaurants are going to healthcare workers at Cone Health. So we would love for your contribution to um, that fund on DGI's website. So please make sure to check it out. So those are my commercials. Um, and I want to make some introductions to our special guests today. So as I mentioned, we are talking about Cinco de Mayo, the history and the tradition of Greensboro's Latino community. Plus, we're excited to give you some tips on how you can have a fiesta at home with recipes from Bandito Bodega and our friends um, Mark from Cocktail Culture, North Carolina. So I'm going to do some quick intros before we get started. Uh, today we have Marta and Clifford Thompson. Marta is a community volunteer and she is all over the city um, with our favorite arts and culture organizations, including Green Hill Center for North Carolina Art, the Greensboro Children's Museum, and Casa Azul. Marta is a native of Morilla, Mexico. How did I do, Marta? Great. Okay, great. thank you. <laughs> Morilla, yes. Okay. Um, Clifford is the president of Thompson Traders, a local family business that designs and manufactures high quality copper sinks and vanities. Clifford is a member of the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, and he's also the chair of Launch Greensboro. He also volunteers at a number of different organizations, including the Science Center, and he was recently recognized as a notable Latino of the triad by the Latino Community Coalition of Guilford. So really glad to have you both here. We also have Nick Binchoff. Nick is the owner and the top chef at his homegrown restaurant and food truck, Bandito Burrito and Bandito Bodega and Nick is a native of Greensboro. And we have Mark Weddle here today, who's the president of Cocktail Culture North Carolina and the operations manager for the local gin distributor, Settler Spirit Co. And Mark is a graduate of Launch Greensboro's Launch Lab. So as I was putting all of these bios together, the common thread that I saw is that all of you are entrepreneurs. You all started um, your own business and have started up here in Greensboro, and so we thank you for doing that. So. I know we got a clap from Luann Flanders Stack head of Launch Greensboro for that reason. So um, I wanted to start with Marta and Cliff and talk to you a little about 
tell us about the history of Cinco de Mayo. I think many think that it's uh, Mexican Independence Day, but I don't think that it is. And um, what's the history and what are your traditions around the Mexican American holiday? Well, Clifford is going to start with the history because he's a historian on his free. That's one of his hobbies. So, yeah, and uh, I'll begin by saying my wife Marta was actually born in Puebla, Mexico. The Cinco de Mayo is actually uh, a celebration of the Mexican uh, battle of. It's called the Battle of Puebla, La Batalla de Puebla, um, but it's where a very uh, small Mexican army defeated a, a much larger French army. Um, and the history around it, it's, it's pretty interesting, but basically the, the Mexican, uh, basically Mexico had just l finished a, a really big civil war. Uh, it was the war of reform. Um, and they had elected a new president. Um, and he was, a, he was known as a president of the people. He was a, uh, um, you know, back in the 1800s, this was 1862 when this happened, and he was basically uh, a common person. Um, his name was Benito Juarez, um, a very important guy in the history of Mexico. Uh, but he, the country was essentially broke um, after the years and years of civil war. Um, and Benito Juarez, in order to fund his government, he suspended all debt payments. Uh, most of the debt that Mexico had, most of the sovereign debt, was to Spain, France, uh, and Great Britain. Well, obviously, these European uh, superpowers were not very happy about their countries being stiffed. And so they sent a force, a naval force, down to Mexico. Uh, and the intention was to intimidate, not really attack, but they wanted to intimidate the Mexican government into paying them. Um, the two major powers, Spain and, uh, and Great Britain, that was their intention. France, at that time, was run uh, by Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon had some bigger designs for, for Mexico and America in general. He wanted to create a French empire in the Americas. And so he was using this opportunity as a way to kind of create his toehold in the Americas and expand from there. So while the, uh, the Spanish and the English went uh, with good intentions to kind of just negotiate a payment, hey, pay us back, you know, when can you get us the money? Um, France really went after it as an, as an opportunity to expand the empire. Um, so... The Mexican government, Benito Juarez, was able to negotiate with the Spanish and the French, and they left. The French, uh, though, proceeded to start invading the army. And the French, at this point, were one of the most powerful uh, militaries in the world. Um, they sent a troop to attack Puebla. Um, specifically, the reason they chose Puebla was because there was um, some money in Puebla. It was about 675,000 pesos at that point that was owed to a French baker. Um, 30 years earlier. From, yeah, it was a 30-year-old debt. So they took, they took this pretext to, to attack Puebla. Um, for the second time. For the second time, thank you. Um, so they went in, and uh, they, uh, em Emiliano Zaragoza was the Mexican general. And he, with 2,000 regular Mexican army troops, um, and then another 2,000 basically peasants with machetes uh, held off a 6,000 uh, force uh, of some of the most elite soldiers at that point in history. So there's two kind of, I think, major consequences that occurred because of this battle. One is that a basically a ragtag group of Mexican soldiers uh, and peasants held off one of the most powerful militaries in the world and defeated them. Um, one often less noted major consequence of this battle was um, at that point in, in history the United States was in the middle of its civil war um, and in, in 1861-62 the south was doing really well the confederate states were really uh, winning the war um, and if the French would have won in Puebla the intention for Napoleon was to go and aid the confederate states um, because he wanted a more secure source of cotton um, so as soon as they won there, they would have gone up to aid uh, the Confederate States, and it could have really turned the whole uh, course of the war for the United States. Um, so two kind of major significant things happened uh, in this battle. Uh, and that's your quick history lesson on, on the Batalla so de Puebla. How did Cinco de Mayo um, become a popular holiday? Was it a Californian? Okay, that's where Marta's going to yeah. So Marta's going to come in and give you that. And behind okay. us, you can see, here's a depiction of the Battle of Puebla. Yes. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, funny thing, I don't want to disappoint you, but Cinco de Mayo is not big in Mexico. Nobody even remembers Cinco de Mayo in Mexico. It started to be huge uh, right after the battle in California, where uh, some miners start celebrating because they were so excited that uh, Mexicans had defeated these um, these imperial force. imperial force. So anyway, it starts there in California, and um, they start celebrating, and that um, that takes new new power in the 60s where there was all the um, movements about the Latinos and equal rights and equal pay in California. So that's where they adopt Cinco de Mayo. Now, it has become huge. Nobody really knows what it is. It's not the independence of Mexico. Um, but definitely, I think now that we know uh, a little bit more, it's a great opportunity to celebrate unity and equality because um, if it hadn't been for this little stop that they have, little stop of the French army, maybe we wouldn't have, um, the, maybe we would have very bad consequences in the United States. So we should celebrate that part of Cinco de Mayo. Um, so anyway, how we celebrate in Mexicans, we really, really don't celebrate it, but we are huge on food. So I want to talk a little bit about Mexican dishes created in Puebla. So there's mole negro, there's chiles en nogada, there's pipián, which is a, a green mole. Um, and the, the most famous dish in Puebla is the chile en nogada, which has the three colors of the, of the flag. And it was created in the independence, after the independence, a group of nuns, and they created it for, uh, to celebrate the independence. So it has the peppers, that is the green pepper, uh, it's filled with fruits of the season. It has pear, um, peach, ground beef, um, raisins, and then on top it has a white sauce of walnuts, and it, it has sprinkled some. Oh, come say second another. Uh, grenadine. Grenadine. Is it grenadine? Yeah. Okay. Pomegranate. Pomegranate. Yes, sorry. correct. So <laughs> it has it has the three colors. Um, and then one fun thing that came uh, from that little um, little period where we had an emperor in Mexico, mariachis were in that uh, created in that period. Because what happened is that Maximiliano was marrying Carlota, and they were celebrating. So mariachi comes from the word from the French word mariage, which is marriage. So they put together a bunch of musicians and they call, they start calling them after that mariachis because it was for the mariage. So that's uh, how mariachis were created in this, in this time um, of, of history. Um, in here in Greensboro, we have a huge Latin community and um, people celebrated, celebrated more towards like their uh, adulthood a little bit more like you know just just to hang out with friends it's more of an american thing they don't necessarily know the history uh but it's you know it's it's fun to be with friends in and celebrate these the diverse um and very popular part, best, whatever yeah. So, Marta, we have a question um, from a yeah. Facebook viewer, and they, their Jackie Gilliam is asking, um, why don't we celebrate September the sixteenth, the actual Independence Day? Is it celebrated in Mexico? Well, exactly. So, September it's called the month of the. ¿Cómo se dice patria? Uh, it's the patriotic month in Mexico. The whole of September. So. Uh, September sixteenth is when we celebrate um, the independence of Mexico. But that's in Mexico. So I think the Mexicans that we are here, we have adopted, like in the 60s, the Chicano movement adopted Cinco de Mayo as their Mexican holiday. Because I think there's now there's two cultures. There are the Mexicans from Mexico and then the, the Latin from either Mexican descendant or, or Latin descendant. That is a, a way that we can all celebrate something um, together not the independence of mexico this is like a new sort of um celebration based on something mexican but really every latin person uh gets together for this celebration sounds like lots of uh celebrations which is 
what I know that you both enjoy so much and bring to our community. So um, speaking of that, um, before we um, head on, we want to continue answering um, folks' questions. Um, can you tell us about Greensboro's Latinx community and, and sort of your perspective on the influence here in our city, both economically through the wonderful businesses and of course culturally through programs like Casa Azul? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. You know, we moved, my family's not originally from uh, Greensboro. Um, we, my mom is from Mexico, of course. My dad is from uh, Chicago. And so we moved here in the early 80s. And when we first moved here, it was, it was minimal. I think there were, there were Latins here, but you didn't, it was very few um, from Mexico. Um, and it's been, it's been really interesting to watch the um, Latin community grow, uh, and specifically the Mexican community. Um, I think they've taken on more significance. You know, um, Mariana Party, who was one of the founders of Casa Azul, uh, I think it's, it's, it's tremendous that now you have an organization that is trying to focus on Latin artists uh, here in the community. And we have a great artist here. And we have, we have a world famous artist uh, who's Mexican who lives here uh, in, uh, um, in Centerpoint, um, Noe Katz, um, and he's world renowned. I mean, he has you know murals in the city of Mexico that he is really top notch. Um, economically speaking, the community is huge. Um, you know, the, uh, anywhere from just having the Mexican supermarkets to other businesses, uh, uh, there is a large Latin community and they're very, uh, you know, Latins really, they get ingrained in areas very quickly and they're very proud of where they're from. So, um, I think they do nothing but really, really help and, and build, uh, build the, the local communities they go to. Well, I'm just talking to them. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, when we talk about Greensboro, we brag about our community, we often talk about the diversity of our residents and mm -hmm. whether that be ethnicity or race or, you know, socioeconomic or um, sexual orientation, whatever that is, it really is what makes our community so vibrant. And so um, we're really honored and grateful to have so many um, folks that live here and that can bring their traditions and their celebrations to our community. Yeah. I'm just so excited that we have Taco Tuesdays because I, there's a saying in Mexico that says that the way to get to the heart is, is through food. So by eating Mexican food, we're getting to the hearts of people. I love you know, that. They're Mexican or whatever you're eating. It's a, it's a way of, of community. That is a perfect segue. So I don't want you guys to go anywhere, but we're gonna switch over um, and talk to Nick and he's gonna share his pico de gallo recipe and maybe Marty, you'll have some ideas too because I know you're such a great chef. Um, so Nick, um, welcome. We're so glad to have you. I'm a big fan of your restaurant and have been um, really since it was a food truck. And so I know that you have a really busy day today um, because it's Cinco de Mayo. Um, but we wanted to hear from you about um, your recipe uh, for Pico de Gallo and anything else you want to share. So I'm going to hand it to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me on. You know, um, what we do here is, is take influences from all over the place, including Mexican food, Asian food, uh, and kind of make it our own. Um, so I was going to share with you guys our, our pico de gallo recipe that we use kind of as a base for um, a couple other of our fresh salsas. Um, yeah, so we'll, I guess we'll jump right into it if that sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, we'll, we normally take uh, Roma tomatoes. They seem to hold up a little better for us, but you can really use any sort of tomato. And we dice them and then we remove the seeds so we get these nice, you know, kind of even square pieces. We, uh, we like to chop our cilantro nice and, uh, nice and even. You don't want to beat it up too much and chop all over it. Just one pass with the knife and we keep it nice and fresh. Um, don't bruise it, as they say, where it starts to turn black, you know. We take uh, jalapenos and we dice them up uh, fairly small. We remove all the seeds um, and the veins to kind of, you know, get some spice, but we're not killing anybody with it. Um, we also like to use onion, but we use red onion. I'm not sure that's super traditional, but uh, we really like the color and then the, uh, the, the, the nice pungent onioniness you get from um, red onions. They have a, a whole lot of that flavor. And so we've got those diced up nice and small as well. Um, also, we use a little bit of chopped garlic. And it might be kind of hard to see in the camera, but this is basically just minced garlic and we mince it up fresh um, and add a little bit of that. And then we use uh, some fresh squeezed lime juice. Got that right there. And then just a little bit of a uh, regular salt. So um, 
you know, this is something you can kind of do uh, as as you like it. You know, the ingredients aren't we don't we don't measure them necessarily. We've kind of got a taste that we look for. So we'll uh, we normally take some of our diced tomatoes, add those in. We'll take our. I don't know, it's hard to see that cilantro. Hey, Nick, we have a question about what the best way is to remove the seeds from the jalapeno, since that's the place that capture the the heat so much. Yeah, absolutely. So the way we do it at the restaurant is we take them and we have them. And then if you have your, your half jalapeno, we then take our knife and kind of just run it right along and then you can get the, uh, the vein and the seeds all in one, pull that out, and then you got a nice clean piece of uh, pepper to dice there. Awesome. Um, then, we also have someone who's saying that they're very um, envious of your sign behind you and that they want one for their children. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell if, 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 if you can read that in the, uh, in the video, but yeah, it's good. Pick up your <laughs> Um, so yeah, the amount of jalapeno you add is really up to you, you know, uh, if you want to make it spicier, add a little bit more, um, if you want to keep it tame, you can leave it out, add bell pepper, whatever, you don't even necessarily have to have that, I guess, but, uh, we like to put some spice in there. So we've added our cilantro, our tomato, our jalapeno, we'll go ahead and put in our red onion. And then, uh, like I said, we use garlic. Chopped garlic goes right in there. Our fresh squeezed lime juice. And you're looking for a nice balance of acidity. If you put too much lime juice in it, you're gonna have a really sour salsa and uh, that may be your thing, but I think most people, maybe not. Add in your salt. And then just give it a nice mix. We get this really nice rustic uh, looking salsa. Pico de Gallo, we call it. Like I said, I, you know, I don't know how traditional that necessarily is. I've had it many ways, but you can see it comes out to be really nice, fresh, colorful. i put it where the camera can see it well. Yeah. So what dishes do you, you serve that on the side, but then also in what kind of, um, in, of your menu items do you use that? Yeah, so this for us becomes a, a pretty versatile salsa. It goes on all of our tacos, our Baja tacos. Um, and then we also use that to make uh, a black bean and corn salsa with roasted corn and black beans. And it's, it's a good salsa, I think, to build things off of. Um, like I said, this way we've, we've become, um, you know, multi-purpose with it. Uh, and then we also use that to make our fresh guacamole. So we, we then take our avocados, mix in a proportionate amount, depending on how you like it, of the pico de gallo. And you get a really nice um, uh, guacamole. Maybe add a little more salt and a little more uh, lime juice if you need to. So how long will that last if we made it today? Um, how long could we keep it in the fridge? Uh, I, I would say it's always best fresh. Um, day of, make it right before, you know, as they say in French, you know, right before you're about to use it. But uh, it would probably be just fine for up to three days in the fridge. Okay. So um, one, we want to thank you. That's awesome. Hopefully everyone um, is going to try your recipe at home. But I'm really curious about, um, quickly, sort of your transition from – starting a business, having a food truck, and then um, now having a storefront. So could you kind of share what that thought process was and starting a business here in Greensboro? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, coming from uh, obviously a cooking background, um, the food truck was a nice transition. You know, I think the same reason a lot of people start uh, food trucks is it takes a little bit less capital up front to get a truck running. Um, you know, in, in that sense, a little, maybe a little less risk uh, up front. Um, and then as we, you know, kind of gauged our, our, the interest and we had a pretty good response from the community, um, especially with the timing when we got started, there wasn't a whole lot of trucks around. Um, so we kind of jumped right in the beginning there. And as we kind of staged everything and work out of, um, and that the original goal was to find a kitchen that we could use um, out of borrowing kitchens from friends or working out of other restaurants here in Greensboro, which was how we started. And that moved to, um, you know, well, if we're going to have a kitchen, we're going to, you know, we needed some income coming in there too. So we happened to find our space on Friendly where we had a ton of room to prep, a ton of room to store food and stage the food truck, but also a little way to do takeout and kind of expand our menu um, in other directions as well. So That's awesome. So where can people find um, the bodega and the truck? Oh, the truck is, uh, is taking a small hiatus, but actually today it's going to be down outside of Beer Co. downtown. Um, you can go down there and get tacos and beer. We're going to be there from 4 until 7 p.m. this evening. Um, you follow us on Instagram, Bandito Burrito um, Truck on Instagram. And uh, the restaurant is at 1609 West Friendly Avenue. We're here all the time, every day, 9, uh, sorry, 
to uh, 1130 to 930. I think I know what I'm up to. <laughs> well, I know you've been super busy. So um, thank you for joining us and sharing your recipe. Marta and Cliff, do you want to add anything to the, uh, the, the pico de gallo? No, that sounds really amazing. It looks delicious. Yeah, it looks really, really great. And it's, I mean, tacos. Who doesn't like tacos? Perfect. Right. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, well, we have so many restaurants in Greensboro that you can um, find today, including Bandito, Bodega, and the truck downtown tonight to celebrate if you're not planning on cooking from home. So, Nick, thank you. I know you have to probably bounce to go back um, to your busy uh, day, but we appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. All right. Thanks, Nick. Okay. So um, as non-traditional it is, I think that the idea of margaritas um, are something that have become uh, an American tradition on May the 5th. And so we wanted to uh, feature Mark Waddle, who is a product of Launch Lab um, of the Greensboro Chambers Entrepreneurial Wing. Of course, Clifford's the chair and Luann's on this call. So mm -hmm. welcome, Mark. Um, you've been um, pivoting yourself by providing cocktail lessons on your Facebook page. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity for you to share uh, a couple of recipes with us. I am prepared because you sent me the recipes in advance. So I've got a grapefruit. I've got a lime. I've got a grapefruit soda. And I've got tequila. And I told the chamber staff I wasn't sure if I was going to actually drink a margarita at 3 o'clock, but thinking maybe it might happen. So, uh, Mark, welcome. Tell us how to make your margaritas and palomas and ask us questions on the feed if you have them. Yeah, well, uh, so I just want to start off by saying it's happy hour somewhere. Okay. So, you know, don't worry about what time it is here. So, uh, well, let's start off with a, uh, with what I like to call a Cadillac margarita. So I think this is uh, the best margarita recipe that I know. And so that's 27 almost years of bartending experience talking. And so this is the one that uh, I, I tend to win fans with every time. So I like to start with silver tequila. The difference between the three tequilas, silver, reposado, and añejo. Silver goes pretty much directly from the still to the bottle. It's not aged, so it has more of a peppery flavor to it. Reposado means rested. So that means it's in wood for anywhere from two months to 12 months. And añejo means aged, so that means it's in wood for 12 months up to three years, unless it's a specialty. So the longer it's in the wood, the more flavor pulls out, pulls out of it. So a lot of vanilla, think that. So I like the peppery flavor of silk. So next we're gonna add some Grand Marnier, which is an, actually an orange flavored brandy base. This uses orange peels, so it's a little bit more of the, uh, I don't want to say bitter, but it's not the sweet flavor of orange that the Cointreau is. So the Cointreau balances that out. So we're going to add a little bit of Cointreau as well. Uh, next, we get into the fresh ingredients. So there are tons of different pre-made mixes that you can buy. Uh, some of them are good. Some of them aren't. Well, I always say use whatever you like the best, but if it's up to me, fresh ingredients are always better. So we're gonna start off with fresh lime juice. We use a good amount of lime juice because I like the tartness. Next, we've got some fresh orange juice. A little bit of that to get a little bit more sweetness. And then actually a little bit of fresh lemon juice to kind of round out some of the citrus flavors. So Mark, if you don't have an orange liqueur or maybe you have a different kind, like a triple sec, is there a recommendation on folks um, using something else from their uh, stash at home? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can definitely use triple sec. There's a lot of different orange liqueurs that people don't sometimes recognize as orange liqueurs. Blue Curacao is another form of orange liqueur. So, I mean, any of those are always acceptable. And, and I'm not saying that you've got to go out and spend a lot of money to make a great margarita because you really don't. Yeah. But, you know, by all means, using what's already available to you is certainly, you know, a great option because we want to stay in as much as possible now. But if you're out, if you're going to go to that liquor store and you feel like making these margaritas, you, you won't regret adding a little Grand Marnier to the triple sec you already have or That's vice versa. Cool. So, and then the other thing is, I like to add just another little touch of sweetness to it. Sometimes people leave this out. Depends. It's up to you. Again, like I said, this is the way I like to make it. 
This is just agave in the raw. So I had just a small amount of agave. Um, so and what, okay. tell everybody what agave is. So agave is, it kind of looks like a gigantic pineapple that grows underground. So there are oh, many different species of agave. Blue agave is what's used to make tequila. So mezcal can use several different forms of agave. Um, but so the, the, this agave sweetener is similar to honey in a way that it's natural, so that it doesn't cause your sugars to spike really fast. Um, plus it also doesn't leave a whole lot of sweetness on the back of your palate. So it's a, it's a better balancing sweetener in an application like this than using like a simple syrup. Yeah. Typically now. And it's not know, a refined sugar, right? And so. It's not, exactly. It's not it a refined sugar. It could be healthier sugar. for you. This is raw. It's like a diet drink. <laughs> exactly, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's delicious and nutritious. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to throw a little ice in this. Patented shaky, shaky, shaky move here. Now, I am one, somebody that has to watch my cholesterol a little bit, so uh, salt is not always my friend, but in a margarita, I gotta have salt. Okay. Um, there's a question from um, our, our followers, and they're asking about rules for citrus. So if you have kind of a mix of things like lemons and limes and um, maybe a blood orange, what, um, what do you recommend? Can you just kind of test it to see what it tastes like? Yeah, that's, you know, kind of a big chunk of the fun is figuring it out. You know, Someone has said that you also can juggle citrus. Is that something you could show us? <laughs> Maybe after this margarita. Okay. <laughs> Was that Sarah Bull that said that? Yes. <laughs> so anyway, so this is, this is what I call a Cadillac margarita. Um, I, if you follow the recipe that, you know, that I sent, that, that uh, you have, um, I promise you'll enjoy it. But again, like I said, that's kind of a big chunk of the fun is just sort of uh, figuring it out and trying what like. Some, some of you might like it spicy, you know, you can, you can muddle jalapeno into it. You can muddle habaneros if you're really brave. Um, there's literally all kinds of avenues you can go down. There's no wrong answer to that, to the margarita question. Okay, are there any other questions about margaritas from the group? We will, Holly has those um, recipes, and so maybe we can share those in the follow-up email after the call so everyone has um, Mark's margarita recipe. Um, so I don't see any other questions right now, so do you wanna move on to the Paloma? Yeah, so um, so this is, a, this is a wonderful example of what I like to call uncomplicated cocktails for the quarantine lifestyle. Okay, do I need ice in this glass first? I'm gonna make it with you. Yeah, ice your okay. glass down. Okay. So let's go do that together. We're gonna to build this right in the glass. So we'll make this as easy as possible. I have ice. You got your ice? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna put one big shot of tequila in there. Oh, should I measure that or should I just eyeball it? I. Uh, you can eyeball it if you want. I don't have a shot glass, okay. Well, just eyeball it. Okay, that looks good. I'm making a little weak since it's three o'clock, okay. <laughs> you don't wanna make it to five o'clock. Okay. So, a little bit of lime juice. Okay. Fresh lime juice, if you don't have fresh lime juice squeezed, if you have lime wedges, you can just squeeze a lime wedge into it. Got it. So just a little bit of lime juice in there. Done. And then, so here's, here's where it expands to whatever you have. Traditionally, this is a two ingredient cocktail. It's tequila and some kind of grapefruit or citrus soda. It could be anything from Fresca to Wink to Squirt, anything like that. Those are all kind of the same flavor sodas. Now there's other recipes that call for fresh grapefruit juice and then club soda, which is totally fine. Okay. Uh, there's, there's, it's fine either way. This is the easiest way I know how to do it. This is Izzy soda. It's grapefruit soda. It's 70% juice. Okay, I have um, this San Pellegrino um, grapefruit sparkling beverage from the Deep Roots. Perfect. You're okay. Just, top it, just top it with that. That's it. Yeah, and then take either a bigger glass or I've got, you know, 
oh, our guy wear here. So it's called flipping your drink. You're going to pour it into one vessel and back into the other. Okay. And, and that's it. Then I'm just going to put a little uh, grapefruit twist in mine. Okay. Because I'm fancy like that. I'm, I'm getting fancy. I was told that I need better uh, tequila, but I'll take recommendations um, I think in this fat function. <laughs> so the cool thing about this one is this is a really easy one to make in a pitcher. Oh, you could batch it for a party. Yeah, because it's really just a couple of ingredients. So this is a good one to make for a pitcher. Leave it ready to go. You just come and refill your ice with it, add more ice, and uh, easy peasy. You what know, do you think? it's as uncomplicated as it gets. It's perfect. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, so it's surprising. I always thought that a Paloma had fresh grapefruit in it, but I'm wrong. Well, it's not necessarily wrong. There's traditional and then there's, you know, modern. I, okay. you know, I think when it comes to cocktails, you know, Sometimes there's right or wrong. Sometimes there's, you know, what's up? It's what's up to you. If you look back at cocktail history, a lot of times it's really, really hard to pin down the origins and the exact recipes of the, of the origins of God. So, you know, uh, it, it's, it's long, I think as long as you've got tequila, grapefruit, and some kind of soda, I don't think it's wrong at all. Marta and Cliff, do you make Palomas? Yes, yes. Actually, those that cocktail is my mom's favorite. So Palomas is huge in in our house. Margaritas, not so much. Palomas, huge. Do you have a grapefruit soda of choice? What? Squirt. Yeah, we really like squirt. Um, Squirt's like the original, I think. That's like, if you look at down and dirty Paloma, that was like how you do the it. The original. Where yeah. can we find it in Greensboro? I know it's sometimes hard to find. Um, so I think, uh, Super G has it, okay. by the way, there's, um, La Lucha in there, the Churreria, which is really good talking about Mexican things. Uh, but yeah, I think Super G has it and, um, all of the little Mexican markets, all of the little Mexican, they all happen as well. yeah. Okay. That's good. So that should be maybe if we're going to go and like try to make the perfect Paloma, we'll yes. try Squirt that. or Fresca is a good substitute. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is delicious. Uh, Mark, we were told that you should rename your margarita to the Margarita. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty clever. Um, well, this is awesome. This and this drink is very refreshing. It is also sort of a disguise because I don't think I can taste the tequila that much. So um, <laughs> I'll be careful at my three o'clock. Um, well, you, you know. The secret to a good cocktail is that it's refreshing and it's balanced. You know, if, if really all you want is just you want to taste the booze, you know, I'll, I like to just set up a platter of shots with tequila and limes and orange wedges. And, you know, that's, that's when we can get down and dirty. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll all celebrate uh, Cinco de Mayo, I guess, in different ways tonight. Um, <laughs> Either maybe we're going out to eat and we're picking up takeout um, to one of our mini Mexican restaurants, our fusion restaurants like um, Bandito Bodega or the um, Bandito Burrito Truck. Um, there's lots of cocktail options. I know people have mentioned different varieties that you can get at the ABC and places to get grapefruit sodas um, and all kinds of citrus. So um, we're super lucky to have um, such talent in our community and of course in our entrepreneurial community. So uh, Mark, thank you for joining us and sharing all of your uh, tips and we can find you where if we want to continue to watch your um, Facebook videos, right? Yeah, most of the, most of the time I do uh, videos on my Facebook page for Mark Weddle. I also do every other Monday try on stage i do uncomplicated cocktails for the quarantine lifestyle at seven o'clock so next monday we'll be uh, talking about infusions how to infuse liquor uh ideas pitfalls and uh you know whatever questions anybody has Awesome. Well, everyone stay tuned to the triad stage. Um, and so I want to thank you. Um, I also want to give a commercial for things that are coming up. So um, tomorrow is work from home Wednesday. 
And um, that is Deborah Hooper, our COO, leads those calls. And she is going to be talking to leaders from Empire Services and Alfred Williams and Company, um, talking about how to reopen our offices right now. We're all thinking about what our office lives are going to look like if we um, migrate back into our workspaces. And so she's going to um, interview them about tips to sanitize, to disinfect our offices, um, all while protecting our furniture. Office furniture is something that we all have to think about investing in and keeping up um, as we have visitors to our office, whether that's our staff or our clients. And so Deborah is going to be covering all sorts of topics around keeping things clean and also keeping things up to date um, so we don't have to spend more money on office furniture. Um, so please uh, join us tomorrow at three o'clock for that session. I also want to plug next week's Try This Tuesday. Um, Next week, I'm really excited. Um, I am working with the Greensboro Grasshoppers, and we are going to bring the hop and fun to home. So we're going to bring all the elements, except for the actual baseball game, to the call. Um, we're going to have a Star Spangled Banner. We're going to have a seventh inning stretch. We're going to do nine innings of interactive baseball trivia. So get ready. Um, and we also have a great special guest. I'm excited to announce that Derek Shelton, who's the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, who once played in the early 90s here in Greensboro for the Hornets, is going to join us live on uh, Zoom. And so we're going to talk to him about his memories in Greensboro playing uh, baseball um, and how his life is now um, in Pittsburgh leading in, in uh, major league baseball team. So if you love baseball, if you love Greensboro, if you love Guilford the Grasshopper, they're all going to be on the call next week. So um, bring your kids, bring your families, bring your Cracker Jacks, maybe a hot dog, um, and we're going to have a baseball game at home minus the baseball. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Thank you again. We'll send out the recipes for the margaritas and the palomas. I hope everyone has a great conversation tonight about the history of Cinco de Mayo uh, while we have our own kinds of celebrations because really appreciate Marta and Cliff's um, history lesson. It's so interesting to think about how little bits of time really impact our lives today. And of course, um, the events of Cinco de Mayo certainly um, changed the way that we're all living today. So thank you both uh, for sharing that. And I hope everyone has a great day. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Happy Taco Tuesday. Eat tacos. It brings us together. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Marta. Bye, Cliff. Bye. Bye. See you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.